I'm Hugh. I'm here from Perks Health, and I'm trying to present, and you'll actually see in these slides, they're a bit of a mishmash because I'm trying to both give you a bit about what we do because people will have questions about that, but also talk a bit more broadly about the promise of virtual health and how we move away from just Dr. Zoom, which a lot of us have experienced over the last you know, 24 months um, since COVID hit, um, and many people are already innovating in that space beforehand, but how do we move beyond tele telehealth um, to the actual promise of virtual health, which, as um, Malian said just previously, it has to be scaled beyond just what clinicians can do. We know that clinicians won't be able to support everyone as our society ages, as chronic diseases become more prevalent. And so we need to enable people to self-manage and get the best results possible. Um, I have an even briefer introduction to myself about ultimately my background is outside healthcare. Um, so I don't have a lovely doctor before my name. Um, I come from a world of behavioural science and consumer engagement, and that is a kernel of what we do at Perks, which is how do we use those tactics that are proven to work to support people to make the behaviours and do the tasks they need to do to achieve their best health. That is my passion. If anyone wants to talk to me about behavioural science, I'm happy to talk on that topic to the cows come home. But today I'm here to talk about virtual, virtual care models. Um, a little bit about Perks, just so you kind of see where we fit into things. So we're a leading digital health innovator. We're a commercial entity, so we're not um, don't come out of research. We're we're a commercially operating business, um, and we we work across Australia um, and now about five different states in the US. Um, I have a team of about thirty people working for me. The majority of those are purely on product. So iterating what we do and delivering a better software solution. We release new versions every two weeks, um, but we also have people who are there to help our customers with implementation, people to help with partnering, um, people who focus specifically on privacy regulations or security, which are all really, really important parts of building a digital health product. And ultimately what we aim to be as a team is a partner for clinicians and a partner for our, for um, you know, healthcare organisations who may not have the software background or the privacy background or the security background um, that's needed for digital health. Um, and what we aren't, and as I even in my own introduction, is we're not the clinicians. So we're here to partner with the likes of yourselves. Um, we work with a bunch of different organisations across New South Wales Health, Federal Health, uh, major insurers and other organisations in Australia and the US. Um, and ultimately, our key differentiator is that we're 100% focused on making a great and compelling experience for patients using our services and putting their health as our number one outcome. What are my goals in this 20 minutes that I've got? So the first one is that uh, to be prepared, the scout motto. So hopefully by sharing things with you, I help you not just reflect on perks as an organisation, but also just more broadly about what we could be doing to better support patients and prepare for the future that we all want to see. Uh, my second goal is the Maximus principle. Maybe there's not as many gladi gladiator obsessives like myself out there, uh, but if anyone's watched Russell Crowe and the gladiator, you'll know he'll say, are you not entertained? Hopefully this is a bit fun, a little bit lighthearted. I'm very aware that I've got the two o'clock slump zone uh, and people are probably sipping on teas and coffees in the background. Um, so hopefully we, I can add a bit of excitement to your day. Uh, but finally, also the 538 caveat. So... As with presidential elections, uh, there's significant forecasting error, and that error is only more significant when n equals one. These are just my perspectives or my thoughts, um, and shouldn't be taken as um, you know a definite future. I'm no oracle. But I'm here to share my thoughts on some of the challenges we face in digital health and virtual care, uh, and some of the things that we're doing at Perks that might help bridge some of those gaps. So what's the mega, mega trend that Perks, uh, we as a team face every day? And it's that healthcare is moving to the home. And if we think about the long arc of healthcare delivery over, say, the last 100 years of modern healthcare, um, very much 50 years ago, before 50 years ago, healthcare was delivered by hospitals. You only went in when you were terribly sick. Uh, and those were episodic acute interventions. Uh, then we had a change in paradigm. We tried to push healthcare out into clinics and pharmacies and you know, whether that's primary care, secondary care, um, to provide those more intermittent touch points, maybe every three months, every six months with individuals, because we realized that it was no longer just healthcare was about infectious disease or injury, 
but actually do these chronic diseases and managing those chronic diseases, which have now grown to be, you know, 90% of healthcare spend uh, are those chronic diseases. And then the final step that we're in the transition right now is how do we move that even one step further into the individual's life, which is into the home. Um, and ultimately, when it comes to chronic disease, most of your outcomes aren't determined by the time you spend with your clinician or the time you spend in hospital. It's an all about how you self-manage. Do you take the interventions or the treatments or the prescriptions that are given to you and actually implement them day in, day out? Do you make those behavioural changes and do those tasks you need to do to get the best outcome possible? Alongside that trend, there's also been a shift in technology. And I'd like to kind of level out here before we go deep on, on virtual care and digital health. Um, so if you think about when things were in the hospital, everything was about hospital mainframes. And these were giant computers sitting in the basements of hospitals, often running on languages like COBOL, COBOL all about improving the productivity and safety of people, of staff working in hospitals. Um, this, the next wave was e-health. And in a way, we're still in this wave. So how do you connect up the systems between different providers, whether they're you know, GP practices and hospitals or whether it's pharmacies connecting into e-prescriptions? So how do we make that data sharing more seamless? And that is still a big challenge. I don't want to pretend like that victory is one. That is very much a challenge that we're still dealing with. And indeed, some of the biggest spend in Australia is still very much focused on how do you hook up e-health systems between all these different um, you know, clinics, pharmacies and hospitals themselves. Uh, but the final shift, which is what we get excited about at Perks, is digital health and specifically virtual care today, uh, which is the patient-facing software. So instead of everything else has been much more focused on clinicians um, and administrators, but how do we actually engage patients in their health and enable them to take charge of their own health because we can't scale the workforce enough to really support people in the management of diseases day in, day out. Um, and how do we make healthcare far more approachable, that it could be accessed anywhere, far more personalised for the individual? So where are, we, where are we at today in digital health? And this is reflecting on my own industry, um, and that is that often... Digital health and virtual care solutions fail to match the lived experience of the patients. So if you think of your typical, you know, hospital frequent flyer or um, patients who, who um, we need to focus on who generate, have the highest risk and most likely to have bad outcomes, generate the most costs. And they tend to be comorbid in often or polychronic or have serious diseases. They tend to interact with many different healthcare professionals. They tend to you know, potentially struggle with behaviour change and that may have influenced why they ended up in the situation they're in or they've, they've been diagnosed with something and all of a sudden they have to form all these new habits. So maybe they've got a cancer diagnosis and all of a sudden they have to figure out how to manage medications, how to manage symptoms, how to log things for their um, doctors, et cetera. And digital health at the moment is very piecemeal in solving those problems. So we, we have specific solutions or specific devices for um, remote monitoring and maybe we'll give them a medication management app but maybe they also have to do physical therapy to manage after a surgery and so we give them a separate product for that and we want them to do video conferencing so of course we use zoom or we use um, another platform to do that video conferencing and telehealth and we'll send them reminders through their email or sms so another whole system again um, and they'll get education from a website you see where i'm going with this so all of a sudden we expect that one patient to be interacting with with 10, 15, 20 different systems or ways of engaging with their health. Um, and that is a big problem because if you think about the lived experience of those patients, you're really pulling them in all these different directions. You're fragmenting their engagement um, in their health and confusing them, quite frankly. And perhaps it's not then surprising that these very patients are the ones who don't turn up to engage in digital or virtual care paradigms. Um, when you survey the top 25 US health plans, they say that patients failing to engage is their number one challenge. The challenges aren't technical. The challenges aren't about security. The challenges aren't even so much on the provider side. It's all about how do you engage patients. Um, and they don't use online provider platforms. They struggle to enroll in these digital care programs. And then they don't persist with using those programs. So our ambition at Perks and our vision for virtual care is how do you combine that all into one? 
how do we empower five-star chronic care with engagement that's truly fit for the digital age? And before I talk about what this looks like in health, I like to draw a, par a parallel to if we think about our, our financial health or, um, and how we do our banking. And sometimes when we think about telehealth, it's as if people, instead of going into the branch to do your banking, you can do telebanking. And that's great. You can wait in queue, you can talk to someone and change your banking um, details, you can talk to them about credit cards, your super, all those different things. Um, and that is a first step and no doubt a useful one. Um, but the promise of virtual care has to be more than that. And in the banking paradigm, we don't get 20 different tools to do our banking from our bank. They give us one tool, which is the place where we can do our super, do our credit cards, interact with support, um, change our passcodes all through the one app. And we can really start to self-manage that in a comprehensive, engaging experience as an individual. So our vision for virtual care is the same thing, but not for banking, but for healthcare. And so what we see is a future where you have solutions that are all in one medical self-management. So instead of giving people point solutions for medications, physical rehab, appointments, proms reporting, all these different things, we put it in one place and make it there easy to access for the individual. And instead of having to use a completely separate tool for that self-tracking versus what they then report to their care team, um, we then integrate that one tool with a clinician portal that allows telehealth, it allows asynchronous communications with the patient and RPM. So it's just one comprehensive system, the one-stop shop for managing their health. And then we also know that it's really important to gather data on how people are doing. So again, that should all be in the one solution. Um, if we need to link them up with an ecosystem of other partners or they need to plug their devices into that solution, they should be able to do that. Um, and we also know that no journey is, it's not the same journey for everyone. So we need to be able to tailor this and configure this easily. We can't be doing that via you know, software engineers because we don't have enough software engineers to achieve that. It needs to be a really configurable, modular, flexible platform so that we can adapt this one platform across different, with different content, journeys, and resources. And the final step is we need to make that whole thing engaging so that people actually come back and use that product every day of their lives as they manage their health. And they know that this one-stop shop is something that's really easy to use but also something exciting to use, just like all the other things we, look, we love in our consumer lives. And so if we think about that digital engagement, the good news is that if we want to know how to drive digital engagement, there's other solutions we can look at. And this can be things like having everything in the one place, like Westpac Banking, as I mentioned. It can be making it personalised and adaptive. So like Amazon and Amazon Prime offer you uh, recommendations for e-commerce or what, what's the next movie to watch. Um, we should be doing the same thing in healthcare. How do we make it really using leveraging people's smartphone as sessions? So with people watch uh, on their smartphones three, four, five hours a day, how do we leverage that obsession to actually drive healthcare and drive better healthcare behaviours? And Duolingo has done this for education. Duolingo has grown to be, through gamification and a supportive community, the largest language university in the world. So how do we do the same thing in healthcare? And then finally, how do we make this all real time? You don't have to wait for your doctor. You don't have to wait for the clinic to open. You don't have to wait for the pharmacy. But something that is real time for the patient and on patient time rather than being stuck on provider time. Um, and we see that in solutions like Waze or Google Maps where you can see the latest um, traffic reports live at any one time. At Perks, this is the model that we're very much building. Um, and it starts with an idea about precision engagement. And I actually note that in the previous presentation, they talked about this being potentially the future of virtual care is the ability to precisely target people with the right engagement strategies for the individual. And we already have this at work. So we use a range of different motivators, whether that be challenges, peer support, habit psychology, rewards or gamification to make it a really exciting experience to drive perfect days, perfect weeks, perfect years for individuals. At Perks, we believe in perfect days. And that is when an individual is so engaged in their health that they do every single task, whether that's medications, physio, reporting proms, getting to an appointment, um, every self-management task that is going to get them the best outcome possible. And we're very proud to have pr provided 1.3 million perfect days for individuals. These perfect days bridge the gap that exists in healthcare between assigning an intervention through a clinician 
and actually getting the outcomes that we're promised. We know that there's poor medication adherence. We know there's poor compliance to at-home physical therapy. We know that when we implement device monitoring or PROMS reporting, that we get really subpar response rates. And so at Perks, what we're trying to do is complement the strengths of the existing system in, in prescribing interventions and tracking outcomes by, by bridging the messy middle, the, diff, the what, what you might call the intention action gap between getting prescribed something, a treatment or a medication, and actually getting that done every day of your life to best manage your chronic condition. Um, this approach is really flexible and really adaptable to different solutions. We've done it, we've applied it in HIV, we've applied it in diabetes and cancer, we've applied it in Alzheimer's disease where people have a cognitive burden. Um, and ultimately, by cracking this problem about how do you engage people and how to use behavioural science to drive that treatment plan adherence, we're able to support thousands of individuals in getting better health outcomes. And we can do that across any task and any condition. And we've proven that um, time and time again. By far our best proof is a randomised control trial that we ran with New South Wales Health and the University of Sydney. This is a gold standard trial comparing perks to standard care in diabetes. And we chose comorbid diabetes because we know that's a complex area. We know that's an area where people uh, can struggle with adherence. And what we're able to show is that we're able to double rates of adherence to treatment, that we're able to reduce HbA1c as a clinical biomarker, and that we're able to help people get better diabetes control compared to that control arm. Now, you might think that we went out and found a whole lot of 20-year-olds to use our app to get this great result, but the truth is the average age was 59 and a half years old, the average person was polychronic, um, and had a lower socioeconomic status than, than, than average. And so we've really shown that we can achieve outstanding results at the highest level of evidence in quite complex cohorts. And we get really excited about supporting cohorts like these to better help. Perks is a two-sided platform. So a lot of what I've talked about is in the patient app, although we also have a virtual care suite. So we believe in that one-stop shop that provides everything for patients and for clinicians. And the last thing I'll say is that we work with a bunch of different people across the spectrum, whether that's insurers, healthcare providers in both public and private health in both the US and Australia. I'm not sure how I'm going for time and if I've left any time for <laughs> questions, but I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and if you want to, please get in touch.